Hello, everyone. My name is Kara Schramm. I'm a program manager here at the American Hospital Association. Welcome to today's sponsored webinar, Hospitalization as a Teachable Moment, Plant-Based Options on Patient Trays. We're extremely honored to have Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine sponsor and lead this presentation and discussion today. Before we get started, I would like to introduce today's speakers. First, we have Neil Barnard. Neil is an adjunct professor of medicine at the George Washington University School of Medicine in Washington, D.C., and president of the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. Dr. Barnard has led numerous research studies investigating the effects of diet and diabetes, body weight, hormone, hormonal symptoms, and chronic pain, including a groundbreaking study of dietary interventions in type 2 diabetes. This was funded by the National Institutes of Health that paved the way for viewing type 2 diabetes as a potentially reversible condition for many patients. Dr. Barnard has authored more than 100 scientific publications and 20 books for medical and lay readers and is the editor-in-chief of the Nutrition Guide for Clinicians, a textbook that is made available to all U.S. medical students. We also have joining us Anna Herbie. Anna is the Nutrition Education Program Manager for the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medi Medicine, a Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting preventative medicine, especially better nutrition, and higher standards in research. Anna is a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator with a doctorate in health sciences. Dr. Herbie received her Master of Science in nutrition from Bastyr University in Seattle and went on to earn a Doctor of Health Sciences from the University of Bridgeport. Prior to joining the Physicians Committee, she worked as a clinical dietitian and food for life instructor at Adventist Health Howard Memorial Hospital. Lastly, we have joining us Samantha Morgenstern. Samantha is a registered dietitian and client executive for Sodexo, a New York health and hospitals. Um, hospital. So Samantha is responsible for standardization, growth, and development of the clinical nutrition program in the system's 11 acute care facilities. She has worked for Sodexo for 20 years. In November 2021, she began to lead the development, planning, and organization for the implementation of the Healthy Eating Plant-Based Initiative at NYC Health and Hospitals. This program has grown from a few small ideas into a widespread movement that is inspiring institutions to think about how they too can make slight changes that can lead to great and impactful results. We are really looking forward to hearing more from all of our speakers today. So with that, Neil, Anna, and Samantha, please take it away. Well, thank you so much, Kara, and it's great to be here with Anna and Samantha to talk about this important issue. Let me share my screen. First of all, uh, some disclosures. Let me talk about cardiovascular disease. And the reason is that this is the cause of death of most Americans. The artery at the top that you see has those nice red blood cells carrying oxygen through a wide open artery, but the middle artery has what looks like a blister in it. That's an atherosclerotic plaque that comes from having too high of a cholesterol level. And at the bottom, that plaque has ruptured, causing a complete blockage of blood flow. So when the blood flow stops, you have a, a heart attack. Um, so th this is what we're dealing with. But researchers have looked at the role of food and other lifestyle changes in seeing if we can change that scenario. And the power of food has really been remarkably demonstrated. Let me start with a, a brief uh, description of Dr. Dean Ornish's groundbreaking work that was published in The Lancet in 1990. He wanted to see not if we can just prevent a heart attack, but could heart disease be reversed? In other words, could that ugly looking artery at the bottom be opened up to look more like that healthy artery at the top? And he wanted to do this not with surgery, not with medications, but with lifestyle changes. So he, he recruited people in the San Francisco Bay Area who had had angiograms and gave them an experimental program with four steps. Vegetarian foods, 
Why vegetarian? Because we're avoiding cholesterol, avoiding animal fat. Okay, makes sense. Half hour walk every day, manage stress, which is why he didn't do the study here in Washington, DC, where I live, and avoid tobacco. That was the whole program. There was no use of medications, not even cholesterol lowering drugs. But after a year's time, remarkable things occurred. Cholesterol dropped, LDL cholesterol dropped, and quite significantly, your average person lost 22 pounds without counting calories. And when the angiographic findings were compared from baseline to 12 months, you could see an opening of the arteries in 82% of participants, again, without surgery, without procedures, without medication. So to show you what this looks like, this is a slide that was given to me by Caldwell Esselstyn, a surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic. And this is the left anterior descending artery of another surgeon. Yes, that diseased portion in the middle of the, uh, of the artery there, that's atherosclerotic disease. It was too extensive to be stented, and he could not tolerate drugs, stent and drugs. So with not much other option, he went on a totally plant-based diet along the lines of what Dr. Ornish was, was using. And here are the results. Now, if you're having any challenge seeing that right-hand picture, let me encourage you to minimize the little photo strip there or drag it out of the way, because what you could see is that the body is, is healing. That artery has opened up to a substantial degree, which is very impressive. Okay, so what's this all about? Well, when we look at the difference between an animal-based diet and a plant-based diet, we learn some things. So here are animal-based foods. And in that middle column, you see cholesterol. In the right-hand column, you see saturated fat, which stimulates the body to make more cholesterol. And you see in beef, chicken, salmon, cheddar cheese, eggs, they all have both of these. But in plant products, you see something different. No cholesterol at all, almost no saturated fat. There are some exceptions like coconut oil and palm oil, but by and large, plants have a much healthier cardiovascular profile, if I can put it that way. So take a look at something like salmon, which people imagine to be a healthy food. Well, you could see why they would say that, but when we look at its cholesterol content and the saturated fat content, it's more like beef than it is like broccoli. And some foods like cheese have quite a lot of saturated fat in. All right, our research team, here at the Physicians Committee was inspired by this and wanted to see what would happen if we tested a diet like this in people who didn't yet have any cardiovascular disease, disease but were overweight. And what if we limited the intervention to just the diet part without the exercise or stress management? We brought in 64 women, all overweight, and we randomly assigned them to either a low-fat vegan diet or to a conventional diet. And the conventional diet was drawn from the National Cholesterol Education Program guidelines. It was a study using no exercise, just diet change, and it was a 14-week trial. Now, the study showed that both groups lost weight, but substantially more in the vegan group, about 13 pounds in 14 weeks, compared to about eight pounds for the control diet. But what really matters is what happens over the years that follow. For the control group, they put that weight back on. For the plant-based group, the vegan group, they didn't. And the reason we are gonna suggest is because you are not trying to starve the weight off in such a way that you'll have rebound weight gain later. No, instead, you're using a qualitative shift, changing the type of food you're eating, but still eating the amount that you would like to eat. Okay, so researchers have looked at different populations and looked at weight, uh, uh, the body weight in individuals following different kinds of diets. The Adventist Health Study, too, takes advantage of the fact that there are a lot of Seventh-day Adventists, particularly in California. Uh, they are almost entirely non-smokers and teetotalers and health conscious, so they become a perfect population to study. They vary in diet, and in 2009, the American Diabetes Association published these data showing that among non-vegetarians, the average BMI was in the overweight range, 28.8. But as you got the animal products out of your diet, people had lower mean BMI values, especially the vegan group, which had was more than five BMI points below the omnivores. They were in that healthy range, 23.6. But the reason that the American Diabetes Association published this was not because of weight. 
It was because of diabetes, common in meat eaters, rare in vegans, 2.9%, uh, very impressive differences you can see. So that was an observational study. What happens if you introduce a diet like this in people who've not done it before? In 2003, the NIH gave us a grant to put a plant-based diet to the test for people with type 2 diabetes. And we tested a portion control diet versus a plant-based diet. What are these diets? A portion control diet really means that you're avoiding um, uh, excesses of carbohydrate. You're limiting calories to lose weight. Um, you're avoiding the bad fats. A plant-based diet simply means avoiding animal products, keeping oils low, and trying to choose healthy food with what's left. So to cut to the chase, hemoglobin A1C values dropped uh, impressively with the control diet. They dropped about 0.4 absolute percentage points. However, with the vegan diet, they dropped threefold more, more than 1.2 absolute percentage points. That was the reduction uh, with a plant-based diet. So what is a healthy diet? One might say it's fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes, that's a fancy word for beans and peas and lentils, and also all the foods that are made from these ingredients, plus vitamin B12. You need vitamin B12 for healthy nerves and healthy blood. This is not optional. So what's the role of a hospital in promoting a healthy diet? Well, let me draw an analogy. Back in the 1970s, we were struggling with lung cancer. Lung cancer rates were going up and up and up, and there was no secret as to why it related to cigarettes. And I, at the time, was smoking cigarettes. That's right. I would go into my hospital, and in the gift shop, they sold cigarettes. And I would buy them and light up, and the head of surgery was by his brand, and we'd light up together and walk down to the doctor's lounge. Now, we were not stupid. We knew that cigarettes caused cancer. But we knew we were under stress and we thought, well, as, as long as I quit fairly soon, I'll be okay. Well, eventually the hospital made a decision. And the decision was to not allow smoking in the hospital and not to sell cigarettes in the hospital. Now that did a good thing because we realized, okay, time's up. Uh, and everyone knows now about the relationship between smoking and cancer and smoking rates have dropped as have lung cancer rates. Okay. So we no longer have this beautiful display of uh, cigarettes in our hospital gift shop. What we say is, no, this is a hospital. We're gonna learn healthy habits. Well, we have other issues too now, not just lung cancer and not just cigarettes. If we look at colorectal cancer, we've got some good news and some not good news. The good news is that colorectal cancer rates are dropping gradually year by year. This is women, this is men. The bad news is, number one, there's a huge racial disparity. The red line at the top is African-American men. They have, despite the fact that we're getting somewhat better year by year, there still is a huge disparity where African-American men and women are much more likely to die of this disease compared to other races. The other not good news is that among young people, colorectal cancer rates are not dropping, they are rising. And this is true for many other forms of cancer too. And one of the reasons could be bacon is a fad. The World Health Organization said that every 50 gram portion of processed meat eaten daily increases the risk of colorectal cancer by 18%. That's the group that includes bacon, sausage, hot dogs, ham, the little pepperoni slices on a pizza. The processed meats are clearly linked to uh, colorectal cancer. So, oh, it's not just colorectal cancer, it's also breast cancer. And also things like COPD, which you wouldn't think would relate to diet, but in fact do. So here's a beautiful display of processed meats, just saying, come on in and let's dig into these uh, tasty foods. This picture was taken on my iPhone at a hospital right here in Washington, DC. And as you can see, what this says is this is a hospital. These are foods that you should be able to eat. Well, wait a minute. 2017, the American Medical Association said something important. They said, this is a hospital. This is not a fast food restaurant. And hospitals should be providing plant-based meals. They should not be having processed foods offered, displayed, sold to anyone, not the patients, 
not the staff, not the visitors. These are changes that really need to make need to be made. But how do we do this? Well, we learned some lessons from tobacco. The Joint Commission and the Henry Ford Hospital System uh, looked at the ways that hospitals had been eliminating tobacco and drew some really important lessons that we can apply to food. The first lesson was don't wait. We knew that tobacco was a carcinogen and we let it be uh, we let tobacco be sold in our hospitals for far too long. We should have acted earlier. Secondly, don't worry. We were very sensitive to the fact that some fact that some people wanted to be able to smoke in the hospital. Some people found it convenient to buy their cigarettes in the gift shop. Some people complained about the ban. The hospital uh, hospitals learned that we should not worry. Some people complain about anything. You've got to take action for health. Third, collaborate. When the hospitals get together and act as one, it's so much easier. Don't phase it in. Don't ban it in part of the hospital and allow it in some other part of the, part of the hospital. Make the whole facility tobacco-free. And finally, you need buy-in at the top. When the CEO says, this is what we're going to do, it happens. That's what we need to do with food. Now, how do patients feel about this? What if we didn't have processed meats in hospitals anymore? Well, we went into the hospital and inter interviewed 200 patients in their hospital rooms. Half of them were at the George Washington University Hospital. The others uh, were at another hospital in Washington, DC called United Medical Center. And uh, George Washington University is in a more affluent neighborhood, the United Medical Center in a somewhat less affluent neighborhood. We asked two questions. The first question is, how important is it to you to have bacon or sausage? And some people said, not at all. I could really take it or leave it. I'm in the hospital. What do I care about that kind of thing? But some people said it's important or extremely important. This is their normal breakfast routine. But then we asked another question. And that was, if the hospital decided to ban processed meats, in order to reduce cancer risk and to reduce cardiovascular risk. Would you support that? And what we suddenly found is that people agreed with the ban for the most part. They were either strongly in agreement or in agreement or neutral. And only 1% of people said they strongly disagreed. These are just about the same figures we had with tobacco a generation ago. So the writing is on the wall. It's time to serve healthy food in a healthy environment. The most important thing though to remember is that what patients learn in the hospital improves their lives at home. No patient ever said, ever went home and said, okay, everybody, uh, I've got some metformin. Why don't we all try some? Nope, that doesn't happen. But what the patient may do is say, I've learned some new dietary things. They served some wonderful foods in the hospital. Why don't we have them at home here? And everybody can dig in. If we do that, not only will our patients learn ways to stay healthier, but they'll share the same, same knowledge with their family, with their communities. We have a chance to end disparities and save lives. Thank you very much. Let me now turn it over to Anna Herbie. Thank you, Dr. Barnard. Let me get my screen share going. All right. So. Um, I am Anna, and I'm a registered dietitian and diabetes educator and the nutrition program manager at the Physicians Committee. But prior to joining the Physicians Committee, I worked as a clinical dietitian at a small hospital in Northern California. And I want to share today how that hospital made some important menu changes and how that can affect patients. So let's start by putting ourselves in a patient's shoes. So this is Isabel, and she comes to the hospital for cellulitis. She has some comorbidities. She's on several medications. She's scared and anxious about being in the hospital and she's ready for a change. She's been Googling how to eat for diabetes. And if you've ever Googled anything about nutrition, um, you know how confusing and frustrating that can get. So when the dietitian walks in to talk about nutrition and blood sugar management, she's really quite relieved. The dietitian gives her all the information she needs and first steps to get on track for a high fiber plant-based diet. And she now knows that can be really powerful for diabetes. Isabel's inspired, she's ready to change her diet, but then her breakfast comes and it looks like this, some processed meat, eggs, not a lot of plant-based foods here other than the banana. It's very different from what the dietitian just talked about. 
So now she's confused and actually not sure that food could actually make a difference, kind of doubting herself. Because of these mixed messages, Isabel ultimately leaves the hospital feeling disheartened and she doesn't end up making any dietary changes. And this is why the American Medical Association resolution for hospital food is so important. Calling on all U.S. hospitals to include healthy plant-based meals on their menus, eliminate processed meats, and promote healthy beverages. And the AMA isn't the only organization calling for this. Plant-based meals are required by law in both California and New York. And the American College of Cardiology recommends plant-based meals to be served in hospitals and then highlights hospitalization as a teachable moment. So here is Adventist Health Howard Memorial Hospital, where I had the opportunity to work for four years. It's a 25 bed critical access facility in Willits, California. It's a few hours north of Sonoma. Howard Memorial has a great reputation for tasty, wholesome hospital food, and it's in alignment with the AMA resolution. The shift towards offering plant-based options all started when the hospital changed from a set menu to a room service style menu. This allowed us to offer a wider variety of meals and our chef and dietitians made sure this new menu included plant-based options. So with this model, patients can really order any kind of meal they want any time of day within the operating hours of the kitchen. And in the process of making a new room service menu, we did some recipe development. Our executive chef worked to standardize a handful of recipes that got added into our nutrient database, which is Seaboard, and then printed on the patient menu. Our original menu included icons next to the meals that were plant-based, indicating they're a healthy option. So here are a few of our favorite menu items. For our breakfast, we, of course, we have oatmeal, um, but pictured here, we have a homemade granola, and then we also have a power porridge, which is a hot cereal. It's made from brown rice and quinoa. We have this wonderful vegan pancake recipe with bananas and walnuts on top. It's a very popular choice. And then we have a tofu scramble full of veggies with a side of fresh fruit. Some lunch and dinner options that patient can order from our menu include veggie tacos, our house-made black bean and quinoa patty with a side salad, and then a brown rice veggie stir fry. So I will make a note that the majority of our patients don't come to the hospital looking for plant-based options. They come in, they're expecting the standard American diet. And where these options really come into play is when they learn that the reason they're in the hospital could be related to their diet. So our dietitians will talk with them, go through the list of plant-based foods that they should increase in their diet. And these foods are right there on the menu for them to try. We even have some plant-based desserts, including chocolate cake, carrot cake, and of course, fresh fruit. Just like the pancakes, the carrot and chocolate cakes are by default, just free of animal products. Patients order them because they just want a dessert. They're not necessarily knowing that they are plant-based. And we use the system of defaulting to a plant-based option whenever we can. For example, on clear liquid trays, we'll send veggie broth unless the patient specifically asks for something different like a chicken broth. And we've also transitioned to mostly plant-based supplements. For patients who have a low appetite or they need to gain weight, they can choose between a house-made smoothie that'll include fresh fruit and or gain plant-based protein powder, or a Kate Farm supplement, which will come a few times a day. These are all made with pea and rice proteins. And then in the middle here, we also have a plant-based closed system tube feeding formula available from Kate Farm. And then across the street from the hospital, we're actually lucky enough to have our own five acre organic garden to pull produce from. This is run by the Howard Foundation, which is a community nonprofit that partners closely with the hospital. So with this, we can serve seasonal produce as part of our menu. The garden coordinator will come to the kitchen a few times a week with a fresh harvest, and then she'll collect food scraps that get taken back to the garden and used as compost. From the garden, we've been getting root vegetables, zucchini, microgreens, lettuce, strawberries, kale, and a lot more depending on the season. So moving on to part two of the AMA's resolution for hospital food, which is to eliminate processed meats from the menu. And this is because of their link to cancer and heart disease. 
So we're talking about any type of meat that's been transformed through salting, curing, fermentation, smoking, or just any other process that enhances flavor or improves preservation. So knowing this, what we did at Howard Memorial with some support from the Physicians Committee is rethink our breakfast meats. With the new menu, we have options like pancakes and sour porridge that'll crowd out the breakfast meats on the menu, but we also looked to directly replace these meats. So our first attempt at this was in 2017, our chef came up with a homemade sausage recipe. Um, it turned out that was not the best strategy the recipe came out differently each time, depending on the cook who made it. And then it was also very time consuming. So we ended up going back to serving just the chicken apple sausage. But in 2018, we looked at things with a new lens. We tried again and did some taste testing of plant-based sausage alternatives. There's so many options out there these days. We ended up adding the Beyond Meat Bratwurst to the menu since this won the taste test among the meat eaters. This option is pretty high in saturated fat and sodium, so we cut it into smaller portions to serve. And we also have a Morning Star sausage patty on the menu. Some keys to success during this time included giving out lots of free samples. We would walk the halls, encouraging staff to try the sausage alternative, and we had a voting station set up in the cafe where the staff could share their opinion about the new options. We made sure the staff was involved and educated. We really emphasized communication with the nursing staff and the CNAs. Um, that was key because they have the most impact on the patients and they also represent the largest portion of hospital staff. We put up posters, we sent out emails about the risks of processed meats. And with all this positive promotion, there wasn't much pushback when it actually came time to implement the change. And then lastly, it really, of course, helps to offer a delicious alternative on the menu. Now, meat alternatives can be expensive. So having plenty of cheaper, whole food, plant-based recipes on the menu, it's not only healthier, but these foods can balance things out in terms of total food costs. So this will vary among facilities. This is based on um, our food costs. So we found that if you replace or promote oatmeal and with dates and nuts, and instead of that two egg omelet with cheese, you would save 96 cents per serving. Um, if you have a beef per burger patty on your menu, and instead you encourage people to order that bean and quinoa patty, you're going to save a dollar and 41 cents per serving. And say there's a chicken stir fry on the menu, you swap it out for a tofu stir fry, you save 64 cents per serving. So we have had some challenges to overcome in this whole process. Primarily, we had challenges with understaffing and staff turnover. I know we're definitely not alone in this, but as we hire new staff members, every nutrition services employee goes through a short training on the risks of processed meats. And this has been really helpful just to make sure everyone gets on the same page. Then with staff shortages, we have limited time to try new things. So getting new menu items added to the menu was deprioritized. But luckily with the room service menu, we have some flexibility to kind of mix and match different things to make a, a meal. And that allows us to cater to patient needs without needing entirely new recipes. And then lastly, as you'd expect, there were some complaints when we initially made these changes, but now we rarely hear complaints anymore after doing this for so long. The staff really knows what to expect and we see that reflected in the patient's attitudes as well. And overall, we've had more successes than challenges. The goal with these healthy meals and community education is to reduce patient readmissions. And with capitation in our county, this can be a really good thing for the hospital. So we can keep people out of the hospital in the first place. We have outpatient programs and cooking classes. Also, we always offer a plant-based option in our cafe for employees. And we're noticing that staff members who wouldn't normally choose a plant-based meal when they see these meals offered every day in front of them, they end up trying it. And also our patient satisfaction scores have remained high throughout these changes. We hear so many positive comments about our food. People choose this hospital over other hospitals because they know they can eat well. The food is part of that healing process and the patients recognize that. So let's circle back to our patient, Isabel. 
Imagine if instead of being offered eggs and bacon after her RD consult, she was given oatmeal pancakes with bananas and walnuts. Then she had a black bean burger for lunch. And so she learned that eating healthy can also be tasty. She left the hospital feeling inspired instead of confused. She followed up to attend the hospital's cooking classes. And because of this experience, she's made lasting changes in her diet. She's reduced medication needs and lowered her A1C. So to summarize here, we have a real opportunity with patients who are in the hospital to help them make important changes in their lives. Patients see the food on their trays as examples of what they should eat, and we don't want to send the wrong message. When hospital patients are looking for help and information on how to get healthier, food can be a pathway for lasting change in a person's life. So if you'd like to get started implementing the AMA guidelines at your hospital, here are a few simple steps. So first, you want to connect with allies who also want to see menu changes at that hospital, whether it's fellow healthcare providers, dietitians, staff, or administration. You can share resources and information with your colleagues so they understand the importance of these changes. And then it's just about picking some new recipes or easy swaps and then share them around. Once you have the best options, just add them to that menu. And then lastly, a strong education campaign will really go a long way for staff especially, but also patients to get on board with these menu changes. So if you're looking to upgrade your menu, Physicians Committee is here to help. Here we have some examples of recipe ideas. We have some handouts that we can share. We can provide marketing assets that'll help with education for staff and patients. And we've collected a book of recipes here on the left from the West Coast Adventist Health Hospital System. And then on the right, we have the Physicians Committee's Healthy Food and Healthcare Toolkit, which is a great starting point with tips on making changes in hospital food. You can find these resources online at makehospitalshealthy.org. Um, our organization, Physicians Committee, can also do consultations. We can do lunch and learns, grand rounds, and just provide ongoing support to clinical and food service staff who want to make these changes, and this is all free of charge. So here's how you can contact me. Um, thank you so much for your time today. I'm going to pass it over to Samantha. She's going to share about New York Health and Hospitals. Thank you so much, Anna. Let me share my screen. Okay, great. So to get started, I'd like to tell you a little bit, bit about New York City Health and Hospitals. I'll just remind you, my name is Samantha Morgenstern. I'm client executive with Sodexo, and I support 11 acute care um, hospitals in the New York City area, all part of the New York City Health and Hospital system. New York City Health and Hospitals is the largest public health system in the country, and we deliver care to all New Yorkers despite their ability to pay. We have over 70 locations throughout all five boroughs of New York City, uh, providing over a million New Yorkers with care, employ over 40,000 healthcare professionals, and speak over 200 languages. A little bit about the mission and vision and values of health and hospitals, which is really built on five core values, integrity, compassion, accountability, respect, and excellence. There is a video that will be made available to you of our president and CEO, Dr. Mitchell Kast, who really goes into depth around the mission, vision, and value in which we are built upon. And a little bit about the history of how our plant-based program began. So in 2022, um, Dr. Katz participated in the United Nations Climate Change Conference, and he made a pledge and a commitment to lower carbon emissions, utilizing the organization of New York City Health and Hospitals. But prior to that, in January of 2019, we partnered with then Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams, who is now the mayor of New York City, to make a Meatless Monday pledge. 
And this was really the beginning of our journey. We started to introduce meatless options to our patients, serving them as the default item or a chef's recommendation for lunch. And then we extended that option to our dinner menu. Some of the dishes that we served were garden bolognese, three bean chili, rock and chickpea stew, and cauliflower risotto. And these dishes were deliberately chosen because they are dishes that people are familiar with. Most people know what a bolognese is. Typically, it's made with veal, beef, um, pork. Um, but of course, ours was a delicious plant-based bolognese. And chili is also very comforting and something that people are familiar with. From the get-go of introducing this to our patients, we really did not have a lot of pushback because the dishes were very, they were delicious. Um, and the, the thought behind making this offering at just one meal, again, was just the introduction of this idea, which of course was accompanied with a ton of education coming from our dietitians. We then started to think about how we could expand this program. And the thought process and expansion of this program really began in November of 2021. We sat down at the table as a team and decided how we were gonna build the program. And we came up with these four strategic pillars in which the program was built. The science of healthy eating, which really focuses on the evidence that all of which Dr. Barnard shared earlier in the presentation. Culinary Center for Innovation. So really looking at our culinary team and how they could bring their talent to the table and expand upon delicious flavor profiles um, that we know people will really enjoy. Patient and employee engagement. So making sure that our patients and employees were also part of the process in this implementation. And of course, community engagement to make sure that not only are our patients benefiting from this program, but our community and families at home. So as I just mentioned, we really started to develop the program in November of 2021. And phase one of the program was the launch of our plant-based lunch menu on March 1st of 2022. However, prior to the launch on March 1st of 2022, we took everything on the road. So we put together a comprehensive presentation um, where we went around to all 11 of our acute care facilities and explained the why. Um, wh what are the benefits of a plant-based diet? What, um, how are we gonna get our patients to accept these items? How are we gonna educate people in our community and within our hospitals? And of course we had everybody try the meals, which really sold, sold to all of the people that participated. We even took the meals to the patient units so that if there were frontline staff that were unable to attend our presentation, they also had the opportunity to taste the delicious food. And the thought behind that was making sure that, that all levels of employees could really be ambassadors for us in speaking to the reasons why we were implementing a plant-based meal as the chef's recommendation. So on March 1st, we launched this program. We also chose the month of March deliberately as it's National Nutrition Month. So we, we had lots of celebrations and tabling events and marketing on our intranet and internet to try and promote all the wonderful benefits that Dr. Barnard shared with you earlier in the presentation. Phase two of this project was the expansion of the chef's recommendation plant-based menu to our dinner menu and the implementation of a new title within our department called the Food Service Associate. And this title was really important to launch while we expanded the program because it brought in that one-to-one -one, um, experience for our patients. So our food service associates will visit all of our patients. They will not only deliver the meals to our patients, but they will also be the ones to take the selections for our patients. 
Um, and then they will also visit the patients after the meal is served to find out what they liked about the patient and get some real time feedback. Of course, they will provide service recovery as needed, um, but the whole point is to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the patient and provide them with any information that they may have or questions that they may have about the dish. On their iPads in which they take the selections, they have pictures of the dishes so that when a patient is a little bit on the fence about asking for that dish, the FSA is, has lots of information to share with them, not only the picture, but they also have scripting, ingredients, and a brief description about, about each dish. We then moved on to phase three of the project where we started to introduce these items in our five post-acute care facilities. And of course, our residents live in these facilities. So we are introducing them, but we're also presenting them to resident councils, which are councils made of residents that live in our facilities to make sure that again, they're part of the process that they can give us feedback explain to us what they like or don't like about the items to make sure that we get great acceptance. And in the future, we'd like to continue to collaborate with specialty clinics, look at how we could expand on gaining data around health outcomes. Um, and we're also looking to expand into our breakfast menu and beyond. I'm not gonna go into the wonderful benefits of a plant-based diet as Dr. Barnard and Anna shared, but this is an example of one of the marketing materials that we created for our program. This was a screensaver that was launched and available on all of our computers. Um, to this day, it, it runs on computers in all 11 of our facilities. Um, and it's a beautiful picture that really makes you want to try some of these delicious dishes. So of course, being part of a healthcare uh, system and being a healthcare worker, healthcare outcomes are first and foremost, but we cannot forget the impact of this on the environment. Um, and this is just uh, to show you that the effect of beef, lamb, cheese, which are the top um, here up on the chart as compared to rice, beans, lentils and vegetables, which are lower at the bottom, and the amount of greenhouse gas emissions per four ounce serving. I'm also happy to share that we recently calculated data for our baseline year, which was 2021 to 2022 prior to our implementation versus our current year, 2022 to 2023. And looking at overall purchases, we decreased our carbon emissions by 36%. So we're really excited, again, not only about the wonderful acceptance we've had with this program, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, but also around the wonderful effect on the environment. Here is our sample menu. So we have a one week cycle menu, and I would encourage you to look at some of the naming conventions of these dishes. For example, a zesty jackfruit, jackfruit burrito bowl, um, Spanish vegetable paella, Fiesta black bean burger. And it was really important that we took some time with developing the names of these dishes, making sure that they sounded as delicious as they are uh, to try and encourage our patients to try some of them. There's also a variety of flavor profiles um, as it relates to culture. We have a very diverse population. So it was important that we provided that um, as as an opportunity for, um, for us to show those diverse cultures within our menu. And here are some sample or some pictures of our delicious, um, delicious food. My favorite is on the top right, which is our black eyed pea casserole with a plant-based cornbread. Um, below that is a pea pesto. And then in the middle is rigatoni al forno. Um, and in the middle on top is our jackfruit burrito bowl. And some of the pictures, it's very obvious that there are a ton of legumes in all of our dishes. Some of them are hidden. Um, and of course, that is to make sure that we're providing enough protein to all of our patients. As I mentioned earlier, prior to our March 1st launch, 
we really took the show on the road um, and launched a huge marketing campaign about this program. So we developed things like on your top, on the top left of the screen, you'll see a button that all of our employees, not only the food and nutrition employees, but employees throughout the hospital were um, asking us about plant-based meals and menus. We had a plant-based recipe contest where we had all employees submit wonderful recipes, which we have now collected and made into a recipe book. In the middle, you will see our Dynex carts, which are the carts in which we retherm our food. We do not cook anything on site. All of our food is made at one production culinary center um, for all 11 of our hospitals and our five nursing homes. And we wrapped the carts with this beautiful, um, this beautiful banner that we created to really market this uh, project. These carts roll down main corridors of our hospitals and of course are on our patient units. So it really became um, a, a talking point or an opportunity for people to stop and ask us, what's this plant-based thing all about? And then you'll see some pictures of us, of our team at our roadshows, really having some great engagement around the topic. And some more collateral that we developed. Um, we have a welcome letter that goes into all of our admission packets that talks about a plant-based diet and how you can get started on a plant-based diet. We have, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. We have some frequently asked questions. We also developed some table tents for each of our dishes. So you'll see our Sancocho table tent in the middle there, um, which of course shows the dish but it also talks about the wonderful nutrients and micronutrients that are contained in some of the ingredients. We also have recipe cards available for our patients while they're in the hospital and upon discharge that is broken down into smaller servings so that if you tasted something delicious in the hospital, you could then take it home and make it for your family. And a lot of our success is also has also been attributed to our leadership. Um, it is wonderful to have the support and the backing and the inspiration of Mayor Eric Adams. Um, if you've ever spoke, heard him speak about his lifestyle journey, um, it, it's just truly inspiring. And if you haven't, I would encourage you to Google him and you will find um, this inspiration from him sharing how he really changed his his health and his lifestyle from moving over to a plant-based diet. Here is a beautiful picture of our food service associates and you can see in some of the some of them are wearing our buttons um, and it was really important for us to make sure that they really enjoyed what they were doing and that they found pride and they um, we're able to really tell the story. They see our patients and speak with our patients probably more than any other employee uh, during their stay in the hospital. And we wanted to make sure that they were providing a really great experience for our patients while providing really healthy food and delicious. And of course, really important is how we evaluate the results. So since the beginning, of this program, we have been collecting data. We've looked at we've looked at acceptance, we've looked at uptake, um, and we've looked at satisfaction. Our acceptance rate has remained above ninety five percent since March first of twenty twenty one. Our uptake, which is the amount of patients that are eligible for a plant based diet who do not ask for anything different and continue to ask for a plant-based diet has remained around 50% or higher. Um, and this has been really important. About 25% of our patients are currently, we are saying not eligible. However, the truth is that all patients are eligible for, for a plant-based diet, but we are slowly introducing um, this concept to all of our patients. So there are some patients that we are not giving plant-based diets to as a default, but it is something that we're looking to do in the future. For an example, for example, uh, some patients that are on a puree diet, it may be difficult with certain dishes to puree a bean. Um, so we are going back to the drawing board with our culinary team 
to come up with some innovative ideas and dishes that can still provide the same nutrient benefits or content um, while not providing animal protein. We served over 3 million meals in 2022. And of that, almost 350,000 were plant-based from March to December of 2022. And we are projected to serve over 800,000 for this coming year. When it comes to cost, and this is a question that we get all the time, I think there are a lot of skeptics out there, um, knowing that when you go to the supermarket, a lot of your convenience items are much more expensive. Um, but because we are serving whole food, minimally processed plant-based items, we have found the complete opposite. So doing a comparison of our animal protein entrees to our plant-based protein entrees, uh, excuse me, our plant-based entrees, we found that we were able to save 59 cents per tray. And this has, this number is ever evolving, of course, with inflation. In fact, looking at some recent numbers, um, that number seems to be even higher. So to summarize some keys to success that I'd love to share, it was really important for us to identify and partner with key stakeholders, identifying physician champions, nurse champions that could really speak to the message. Um, having a dietitian speak to a physician may not hit as well as a physician speaking to a physician. But I think, of course, we still have to tell that message as we are the experts in nutrition, but having those key champions has been invaluable. Getting buy-in from all levels um, within the organization, having the leadership support has also been tremendous, but having our frontline employees really understand the mission and the reason why we are doing this for our patients, um, has also been incredible. And then having them see, uh, having them adopt some of these changes, we've seen some of that as well. So not only are we having our, an impact on our patients, but also on our employees. Making sure you have the culinary talent. None of this um, could have been achieved without our executive chef team and his ability to really take some dishes um, that are typically made with animal protein and adjusting it to be completely plant-based. Focusing on the planning and development, so taking the time to really put together a business plan to ensure that you have a phased approach um, has been really important and can really help in the execution of a new plan like this. And trialing dishes, so getting feedback about dishes, having a library of dishes prior to launch of a program to get that feedback so that when you do finally roll out, it's not a complete flop and you do have great acceptance. We did do this as well prior to our launch where we substituted some of our regular entrees with a variety of entrees that we serve today as the plant-based chef's recommendation. Um, and we were able to then get some feedback prior to the launch to find out how our patients were going to um, enjoy the dishes. Collecting baseline data, this is something that is really important if you want to be able to show outcomes and show success and progression. Um, we, Because we started really in 2019, we really have a, pl a plethora of data that we've been able to pull from, and that's been great to be able to tell our story. And finally, I'll end with, you know, don't be afraid to start small. Um, we have to start somewhere and by introducing a change in one meal and then expanding to another meal and then beyond, um, eventually you'll get there. But you know, it, this is just a great way to start to introduce, as Dr. Barnard said, some great changes that our patients can take with them when they are discharged from our hospital to their communities and families beyond. And I will turn it back over to Kara to conclude. Thank you. And thank you all for attending today's webinar. We hope you enjoyed the past hour learning more about this important topic. And I also want to give a big thank you to our speakers today. This was a really great presentation. And so with that, we'll adjourn and have a great day, everyone.